Well, my friends, we are continuing our journey through Matthew's gospel, and we spent the last three weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, and it was interesting that each week the theme centered around God's kingdom and how we, as God's people, as agents of the kingdom, are to help bring this kingdom to life. And in fact, just before uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said to the people, I've come to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Well, in today's reading, a little further along in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uh, uses a number of parables, and each time he says, he begins with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he gives a parable as an example of what that is, and uh, this continues the same conversation about God's kingdom and what it is and what God hopes for us, and what I appreciate about Jesus with each of these parables, with each of these things we've had over the last couple of weeks is... Jesus continues to challenge us to expand our thinking, continues to challenge us to be open to the possibilities of what God's kingdom looks like. And so Jesus never says it's exactly this thing, but he gives us these parables and different ways of thinking about what God's kingdom looks like. And, and today I think Jesus uses some pretty, interesting, uh, some pretty interesting ways of thinking about God's kingdom. And... Uh, as a little bit of a preface, not only when, when Jesus talks about God's kingdom, he means it in two kind of time frames. So one time frame is the right here and now today, how God's kingdom comes to life as God's people live it out. You and I, are part of our job and our call as Christians is to help God's kingdom come to life uh, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our community. We help God's kingdom come to life as we live out our faith. So Matthew, uh, Jesus, as Matthew is reporting what Jesus is telling us, is, is first of all talking about today, here, and now. But he also, when he talks about God's kingdom, it's, there's always also, we call it the eschatological sense of it, which is the end of the, the end of the world, so to speak, that eventually there will be a day when God comes and sets all things right and God's kingdom is in its fullness everywhere. So there's always this, this already but not yet sense when Jesus talks about God's kingdom. We catch glimpses of it, we help bring it to life, but with our own sinfulness, our brokenness, the reality of this world, um, we don't experience God's kingdom in its fullness. That day will come. But in the meantime, we're not just to sit and wait for that day. Jesus has called us to live it out, to help bring it to life. And so today's parables give us some more sense of what that looks like. So we get three parables from Jesus, and the first one is the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And then Jesus tells two more, and then he comes back around and he explains the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through this reading. And um, before we get to the explanation of the wheat and weeds, we'll first tackle the middle ones that Jesus talks about. So you'll see where we're going with this. But what I want you to be open to today is continuing to ask the question, so what does God's kingdom look like? And what's my role to play in that? What is God calling me to do? How is God calling me to be a part of this? But let's start out uh, in verse 24 as Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. Matthew tells us, Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? When enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? No, he replied. You'll uproot the weed if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them and put the wheat in the barn. Okay, interesting parable. There's a lot of interesting pieces there, and in a little bit, Jesus is going to explain it to us, and we'll talk about it. But I think that parable in particular gets at a key question that maybe a lot of us have asked, which is, why does God allow suffering in the world? Why does God allow evil in the world? That parable gets at that a little bit, so we're going to come back around to it. But these next two parables are very short and succinct, and I think they're powerful. They provide powerful imagery for you and I and how we're called to live. So listen to this, verse 31. Here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. 
it grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. So let's stop there. As you heard these two simple explanations by Jesus of the mustard seed and the yeast in the dough, what, what are you hearing in there about what God's kingdom is like, what the kingdom of heaven is like? What, is that, what, did, what did you catch out of that? What came to life for you? What did you notice? What's that? It spreads. It grows. And, and it starts from what? Something little. And it spreads and it grows. It spreads and it grows. Absolutely. We're going to talk more about that. What else did you notice? You might be hungry, but you what? Heard about a garden and a kitchen. I love it. All right, so uh, there's, these are places where sustenance is provided, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That has something here to do with feeding, perhaps, or at least providing for. In fact, what, kind of, what is provided for by this mustard seed, ultimately? What was the result of this mustard seed being planted? What did it do? What did it become? A tree. And once it became a tree, what happened? Birds nested in it. It provided shade and birds nested in it. Now, walk with me through this. So, first of all, this mustard seed is one of the tiniest of seeds. And the seed that's planted grows into a tree. And then this tree now provides a place for nesting and a place of shade. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the tiniest of all, that grows into this tree and then provides shade and rest and home. An incredible vision of God's kingdom that as you and I live out the kingdom, uh, people are cared for. People find a place to rest. They find their needs taken, uh, taken care of. Those, we could say, who are hopeless find hope. Those who are hurting find comfort right? This vision of God's kingdom, ultimately, as you and I live it out, it has to do with caring for the world around us in really interesting ways. Now, also, I'll say this about uh, the mustard seed. This, This particular kind of mustard that would have grown in this area that they were familiar with was also kind of one of those things that was also rather invasive. That is that, um, it very quickly grew and spread all over. And so they knew this to be a plant that, you, that they, from, the, from a gardener's perspective, they had to be careful with it because it could take over the garden. But from Jesus' uh, parable here, it's this idea that God's kingdom, not only is it one seed that grows into this tree, but it keeps on going. It keeps on going. Dana. Dana said that both of these things kind of go towards people's daily needs being taken care of, but it starts out from this littlest of thing, and then people are taken care of. Food and shelter. Now, isn't it interesting to think about, uh, I love this analogy of yeast. So how many of you are bread bakers or uh, like to make things that uh, involve yeast? Any, some of you, all right? Uh, we, we have some guests at our house overnight, and so last night before we went to bed, Anna pulled out some frozen uh, cinnamon rolls out of the freezer and put them in a pan. And I got up this morning, and the pan was full, and they were starting to come over the top. And I thought, well, I hope they wake up in time before it's too late. Um, but it's amazing, isn't it, what yeast does in dough? And I love this analogy that it just takes a little bit, and it permeates the whole dough, right? That this idea of what you and I are called to do and to be, there's a ripple effect that happens. The impact keeps growing. There's almost this exponential factor that happens here. 
But what's really incredible about this analogy of the dough is the whole batch is affected by it, isn't it? In this really incredible way. Um, I didn't get the comma rolls this morning, but I sure would have, would have liked to. Pretty amazing thing. But here's, here's what I want to challenge you with. This mustard seed is this tiny little thing, this yeast that just takes a little in the dough. And how often is it that we, as God's people, think to ourselves, well, there's not much I can do, or I don't have much to offer, or God really can't work through me because I don't know, or I've never done, or I don't have that gift. How often do we doubt that God could really use us or do much with us because, well, we just don't have much to offer? And now, many of us grew up as humble Lutherans, and that, comes, that kind of thinking comes very naturally. Well, I just, you know, I do my part, but it's not much. Friends, Jesus is promising us today that God can do a whole lot with just a little. God can do a whole lot with just a little. And I, for me, that's what's really incredible about this analogy is to say never doubt that God can take the little bit that you think you have to offer and God can use it for God's purposes. God can use it for God's purposes. Your presence sometimes is simply enough. Your prayers are powerful and make an impact. Your love or joy or hopefulness can have an exponential effect. And we are so, it's so easy for us to believe the lie that God can't use us, or we don't have much to offer, or, well, we used to, but no longer. And we buy into these ideas that somehow God really can't do much with us. Jesus says it takes a mustard seed, it takes a little bit of yeast, and look what God does with it. Now, let's continue because Jesus now will explain the parable we started with, the wheat and the weeds. And in a, for me, in a bigger way, this draws us back to what we as a whole church are called to do and to be. And, and we want to think about this bigger picture about how God's at work in the whole thing. And so in verse 36, it says, Then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house, and his disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man, that's Jesus, is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Okay, so we get Jesus' explanation of how we're to think of the allegory here, of what each of the pieces represents. But I think there's, a, there, there's different ways people interpret this, but I think there's some really important and powerful ways to understand what this tells us about God's kingdom. So I want to ask you, what are some of the things that jump out at you, or what, how are you interpreting this? What, do you, what are some of the points you think Jesus is trying to get us to wrestle with here? presence of evil in the world. I, I think Jesus is tackling that one head on right here, right? And how many of us have asked that question? Uh, why does God allow suffering? Why doesn't God come and take care of the evil and just get rid of it? This is an interesting way that Jesus comes at it here, isn't it? Now, I think there's one way that, this, that, this, that the al analogy breaks down. And, and that is this. You know, um, how many times, have, you know, you've heard that expression, well, he's a bad seed, right? And I think some people have taken this to say, well, you know, from the beginning, people are either good seed or bad seed, and that's the end of the story. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here, because an important part of this is God's patience, right? Now, let me ask you this question quick, though. Who, who are the harvesters in the story? The angels. So whose job ultimately is it to sort out the wheat and the weeds. Is it ours? No, it's not. It's not. But notice God's patience here. God says, no, no, no. We're not going to do that yet. We're not going to do that yet. Because when we start doing that, we're going to uproot the wrong thing here. We, we're going to let the whole thing go. And, I, and for me, part of that is God's patience in that it's, I think it's not too late for those weeds. Again, this is where the analogy breaks down. 
I think part of God's big picture is that there's always room for redemption for us. There's always room for God's grace and mercy for us. And we do have the devil. The evil one is constantly trying to pull us away, constantly trying to plant his seeds in our heart to make us people of bitterness or people who turn our backs on God or people who cause destruction in this world. But God is also there, and God's people, we are here to bring something else to the table, to bring people to life, to help them discover who God is and what God wants for them. And I think this parable is a parable of God's patience and God's hope of of God's people growing into who God wants them to be. So here's the interesting thing about um, the weed and the weeds in this story. You see, um, the the particular weed that's being talked about here is a weed that looks just like the wheat. So as they're growing, you can't tell the difference. You don't know the difference between them until they bear fruit, until the harvest time. So there's the sense that this could go either way. This could go either way. And we won't know until the end. And in other words, you and I get, can be people who give life or take life. We can be people who follow God or choose to turn our backs on God. But, but there's time for us. And there's always time for God's redemption, for God's grace and God's mercy. And what Jesus is reminding us here, though, is it's not our job to determine who's the weed and who's the weeds. Because isn't that often our human tendency? And it's easy for us, I think, to just write people off, to say, well, there's a bad seed over there, or they'll never change, or um, God will never be able to use them. And maybe that's true. But we have a God who doesn't give up on anyone. We have a God whose love and grace and mercy is far bigger than we could imagine. And we have a God who calls you and I to be the yeast, to be the mustard seed. And as that yeast permeates the dough, well, there's opportunities for others to come to know God's love. There's opportunities for others to have their hearts and minds changed. There's opportunity for people to catch a glimpse of who God is and what God is about. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, he's speaking to you and I and saying, my people, you have been gifted and called to be agents of change. As we've read in the last weeks, we're called to be salt and light, right? We are called to live out this faith in daily life in a way that creates a ripple effect, in a way that helps others to come to know and see who God is. For me, this parable of the wheat and the weeds reminds us of the bigger picture of the mission that we've been given. The bigger picture of there there are people out there who don't know Christ. There are people there who live in bondage to addictions or in bondage to sin that they are trapped in. There are people who are suffering with all sorts of things, and we as people of God are called to be the yeast and the dough. We're called to be the light and the darkness. It's pretty incredible to be a part of that. And what's amazing to me is Jesus says, and guess what? You who says, well, I don't have anything to offer. It just takes a mustard seed. It just takes a little yeast. Jesus says, yeah, I'm talking to you. Talking to you, all of us. Jesus doesn't uh, just say, I just need the people who can talk the best or sing the best or do the best. Jesus says, I gave you gifts, and I want you to use them. It doesn't take much. A little bit of yeast permeates the whole, the whole dough. So um, it's interesting, isn't it, that over these last really five weeks, Jesus, week after week, is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus talked about this a lot. In fact, Jesus said, I've come to declare the good news of the kingdom. We as God's people have been given this message to share with the world. Jesus is concerned that God's kingdom comes to life, and we get to be the ones who do it. We get to bring it to life. And sometimes that's in our homes or in our workplaces or our schools. Sometimes it's the way we as a church bring it to life in our community. But this is core to who we are. And I want to challenge you to continue to think about the ripple effect that you create, the ripple effect that happens in your world as you are a person of hope, 
a person of joy, a person of grace, a person of love, and the impact that makes. It just takes a little bit of yeast to permeate the whole dough. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we apologize to you for thinking that we don't have enough, that we aren't enough, that we really can't do anything or make a difference. We apologize for forgetting that you made us and that you've called us to be your presence in this world. And so God, we ask you to help us to trust that we're enough, that you've already given us what we need to be the yeast in this world, to be the light in this world, to be the mustard seed that provides shade for others. Help us to believe that you really can and do intend to work through us. Help us to trust that you have it all. You've got it all in your hands. And that our job is just to simply to live into that. So God, help us to be people of mercy and grace and hope and love. People who share our faith in life-giving ways. Help us also to be people who never give up on others. Who continue to pray for and be present with who continue to love and offer grace and mercy. Help us to have your eyes for your people. Help us to dream the dreams that you have for this community, for our workplaces and our families. And help us to continue to return to you with open hearts and minds so that you can transform us. We thank you, Jesus, for your love and your grace and your mercy. And we thank you that you call us to join you in bringing your kingdom to life. It's in Jesus' name we pray.